Good morning. Thank you for coming. Come on in, folks. Welcome to Becoming a Technical Leader. We're so happy you're here. We're very happy that people want to advance their own professional development as well as learn technical skills, and that's what we're here to talk about today, is how those two things come together. Cell phones off, please. You're going to see this a thousand times this week, but since this is the first session, we'll make sure. If your phone rings and you have to answer, you have to share the call with everyone in the room. That's, that's my rule. Okay, I'm just letting you know. Yes. Yes. Turn your ringer off right now. I want to see it. I'm just making sure you're trouble. How many people are at their first pass summit? Wow. Oh, that is awesome. That's awesome. All right. So you're going to hear a lot this week about all the things you can do with PASS year-round. Um, local groups, virtual groups, chapters, SQL Saturdays. I encourage you to check that out because being part of this community absolutely can change the trajectory of your career. So I encourage you at some point this week to stop by the community zone and learn some more about things you can get involved in. All right, here we go. My name is Denise McInerney. I am a data architect. I work at Intuit. This year is my 15-year anniversary at Intuit, actually. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my journey later. But I've done pretty much every job in the data space. I started as a DBA, and now I work on the analytics, uh, in the analytics world. And I've also been very involved in women in technology initiatives, both here at PASS and in my company. Um, and I'm a big believer in the benefit of the tech community. So I've been involved in a number of ways for a number of years. Uh, my name is Kellen Gorman. I am a handful. Uh, I, I'm known more on the Oracle side than the Microsoft side. You're all supposed to go, oh, yuck. Um, I was an Oracle Ace director. A, um, I'm an Oak Table member, which is a group of uh, exclusive Oracle scientists. There's about 100 of us in the world. But uh, I've always been multi-platform, so Microsoft stole me. So that's, I'm over here. I spend a lot of time building Oracle databases on Azure and bare metal. So that's, that's what I do. But I came over here to learn analytics and AI. I have Patrick LeBlanc's old position because I thought, oh, this will be cool. And then they found out I learned, I knew Oracle and it just kind of went downhill from there for me at, at Microsoft. But um, I have been pretty much synonymous with WIT on the Oracle side. Um, I love the Microsoft community. You know, they were just talking about PASS and how you can get involved in that. I will tell you straight out, when you're on the Oracle side, it's going to cost you money no matter where you want to go, what conferences you want to attend. And I loved it that PASS was free. You know, you could get your membership and go to your local user groups and get these virtual events. That is awesome. Take advantage of it. OK, so this session is part of a learning pathway. Learning pathways are new this year at PASS Summit. They're groups of three sessions that are curated to work together, to complement one another on a variety of topics. So this is the technical leadership learning pathway. And there, this is the first session. There are two more sessions tomorrow on making the leap to management. And what was the title of the items? I forget. Uh, taking leadership to the next level. So I think if you're, if, this is something you're interested in doing. We work together with uh, the other speakers to ensure that these sessions um, complement one another. So I encourage you to check that out and the other learning pathways as well. My turn first. Um, so how I started in the technical world, I, I came into this very weird. We talk about the accidental technologist. I had about uh, five documented strokes, could not perform my previous career any longer. And as my brain was healing, I had been selling shoes, and a couple of my peers ended up going into the industry. They were selling computers. And they said, you should take Kellen, too. I bet she can do this. We call her Kevlar. She's bulletproof. And I was like, OK, I'll try. And I made like $1,000 my first day in the sales floor. And I'm like, oh, this is fun. And uh, from there, we figured out I had a knack for software and went into desktop support. Oracle wanted to know how I was configuring 16-bit Oracle apps, multiple ones of them on Windows 95. They said it couldn't be done. I was doing it. After they got finished looking at that configuration, they said, make a DBA out of her. So I did my certification, went for my first job. They hired me straight out, no experience in any database. And they said, here's your database. And it was a 7 terabyte byte SQL Server 7 clustered on a compact SAM. One of that, you call, you call Microsoft, and they're like, we can't help you. Have fun. Yeah. Um, so my baptism of fire was really started out SQL Server, and then I was handed Oracle databases and Sybase and Informix and everything else. But I still say I'm always a DBA at heart, but I was really big about automation and scripting. Um, I used to have a little sign on my door that said, you know, if you don't go away, I'll replace you with a small, efficient bash script. That, that was my world. 
And uh, that's pretty much what I'm doing even now. So I was known for changing careers every two years where you're, you're celebrating anniversaries. As soon as I start getting to a two year anniversary, everybody in the company is very nervous. They know I'm probably looking at my next opportunity because I'm an ADHD spokesperson. And I like new, <laughs> I like that, that second D is dynamic. It doesn't have to be disorder. And I like new opportunities. I like the shiny stuff. And as soon as somebody says, this will never work and we need to deviate to look at it and tell us it's a failure, I'm like, I'll go do it. And I turned it around and tried to make it a success. But I became a DevOps engineer. I started automating everything, started writing curriculum and teaching DevOps and having a really good time with it. I do a lot in Terraform. But when I got to Microsoft, we had these deployments they were saying was taking 10 weeks. And so I automated it down to 10 minutes with bash scripts. And because some of my coworkers were out of the office that day, they couldn't tell me to write it in PowerShell. Yeah. So that's my world. That's who I am. I also started my tech career as a DBA. I got my start in the first dot-com boom. Uh, anyone around for that? Uh, in the SQL Server world. So I've been in this space for a long time. Um, and I worked as a, my first job at Intuit, was also DBA. And after a while, I was thinking, what's next for me? What's next for me? And I'd heard the architects and some of the engineering leadership like in the hallways having conversations about Hadoop. What's this Hadoop thing, right? Now it's, now it's everywhere, but 12 years ago, it wasn't, right? So I started getting interested in big data, what that meant, went to a couple classes. My boss noticed this, and he gave me an opportunity first to be an analyst, which was not on my plan. But being an analyst introduced me to what that side of data looks like, especially from the consumer side. And I quickly realized that we did not have the infrastructure we needed for our analysts to do what they needed to do. And I actually switched, again, from being an analyst to being a data engineer, starting to build data marts, right? And proved myself there, got more um, knowledgeable about that side of, of how to build uh, what the data world. And eventually became the, one of the first five members of the data engineering team in our small business division. Now, it's crazy to think we didn't have a data engineering team. Our small business division includes QuickBooks, which is a huge product for us, and a number of other things. And what we had was a bunch of siloed data marts, data warehouses-ish things, sp sprinkled all over the place. So I got an opportunity to help bring all that together. Because we all know that to do analytics, you've got to combine data. You, can't, you can do very limited analytics on one data set. So I got that opportunity. I spent four plus years there, and about a year and a half ago, I got an opportunity to be part of rebuilding the same function, the data engineering function, in our consumer group, which is TurboTax, for anyone who does taxes, mint.com, any mint users in the house. So, um, and all of these things were just me expanding my knowledge and expanding my influence, which is what we're going to talk about today, and that created opportunities for me. Um, and so now I'm a data architect. I've been in that role for about five years now. Um, and working on a whole lot of stuff in the space. So one of the things that we are discussing when you talk about our roles and where we have come, where we're going, is that you're thinking, well, this is a leadership talk. And one of the things that has been very important to me is to say leadership doesn't actually have to do with a role. Um, my last position, I did report up through the CTO. I was the, uh, they call it the technical intelligence manager. And it was a, a title they just gave me because they couldn't figure out how to box me in anywhere else. It just didn't make sense. Um, you know, I was an evangelist. I spoke, spoke at conferences. I was building out a roadmap. I understood the competitive, you know, the, all the different uh, customers. Grant will tell you he hated seeing me in any of his sessions, Grant <laughs> Fritchie, because I knew his product of SQL clone and SQL provision better than he did. He's like, just go away, Kellen. Um, <laughs> But that was my role, and the thing was is I found that I was much more successful using my leadership skills outside of my actual professional job. That was really good for me because that way I could keep doing the cool technical things inside my job that I was doing. And that made me very happy. So we start talking about what a technical leader is. A technical leader means that you're going to bridge outside of just your job to build out your job. Um, I have served on boards. I have been part of groups. I have mentored. I have mentored. I am a mentor for Tulane for women in tech. Um, that's my alma mater. Went back. I spoke on the keynote for their, their women in tech and their IT tech day. Those kind of initiatives, when you take them up, then progress. And, of course, your CV and in LinkedIn, we start talking about those things. Really build your career. I can honestly say that I have not had to fully 
completely interview for my last four positions. People came to me and said, I want you to take my job. Patrick LeBlanc came to me and said, you should apply for my job. I'm like, I've never done analytics or AI before in my life. You'll love it, you know. These are the kind of things you want for your career, and that really is much to do with technical leadership, more so than the role that you hold. So we talk about that. That will build your career. So these bullet points are what we're going to go through today. These, we, these are the things that we think are key skills to developing yep. as a technical leader. So there's a guy, actually, he's passed away a few years ago. His name is Bill Campbell. And he was a pretty famous executive coach, uh, especially in Silicon Valley. He coached Steve Jobs, Sergey and Larry from Google, Sheryl Sandberg. Um, he was the CEO of Intuit for a while. He coached Brad Pitt. Uh, Brad Smith. Brad Pitt. Brad Smith. Brad I like Pitt was Brad not our Pitt CEO. Better, though. Brad Smith was our CEO. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no. Brad Smith was an awesome CEO. Um, How many of you are going to put that down that this talked about Brad Pitt? Pitt? I like that, though. So this quote is from Bill Campbell. And he said, your title makes you a manager. Your people will decide if you're a leader. And it's up to you to live up to, to, the, live up to that. We're not talking about management today, but we're talking about leadership. And the same applies, right? How you conduct yourself, what you do, your people, the people you come in contact with throughout your job will be the ones to decide if you're a leader or not. Leaders have expertise and they share it. They're not selfish. They influence other people. That's leadership. And they deliver outcomes. People can talk all day and deliver no nothing, right? That's not leadership. People, often, the smartest person in the room is not necessarily the leader because you have to bring these things together, this technical competency and these leadership skills. We'll just go past that one. That just leads you in, huh? Yeah. Um, one of the things is that I've always understood company goals whenever I've gone somewhere. It wasn't just about the goals that I wanted to achieve, but how could those goals be married to what other people wanted to achieve? That went for my manager, that went for my coworkers. By getting their buy-in into what we all wanted to achieve made a difference in how we reached our goals. So this would be a lot about those soft skills that you hear about. Everybody's got to have these soft skills. This is the most important thing to know. It was. Um, I had a tendency to love working with DBAs that may be a little more socially awkward. Um, my favorite, Terry, I'll tell you straight out. Terry, you can look on the web. You'll never find him anywhere. He believes the man will find him. He's not going to be out there. Me, on the other hand, you know where I am 24-7 just by looking me up, doing a search. But he would be very kind of quiet and not talk to anyone. I had lunch with him probably two times in the three different jobs we worked on together with. But I started to sense when he would be upset. I would listen to the words he would use. And then I would try to vocalize for him with our boss when I'd be like, you need to listen to Terry right now. Or Terry said this. And I think it's really important that we take his opinion into perspective as we make these decisions going forward. And it helped me get his backing, and we became very good team members. I knew that even though I handled a really huge workload and could do like, we'd end up like in a problem, a crisis situation, and I would do like 95% of the problem, figure it all out, and I'd look at it, and if you thought of it like a puzzle, all these puzzle pieces, I'd be like, I got stripes, I got a tail, I know the puzzle is a tiger. And he'd come in with that last piece because he was very methodical and careful and he just worked through things very slowly and he'd punch that into the puzzle and all of a sudden like, zebra, Terry, you know. <laughs> but I needed him. I always knew that. We were very well balanced, very different skills. He was very much a transactional DBA. I was a big database person. I was a multi-platform person. He only touched Oracle. But the two of us together could make any environment sing. And understanding what his goals were for a comfortable work environment and marrying them with mine, because I didn't want to get paged at night because he was very happy just to go back to sleep. I was up all night. And understanding that he didn't like a lot of changes. How could I minimize the changes from the development group and get them to work better together, which again went back to my communication skills, work together for everyone so we supported each other. And you see the same thing there. By doing that and making sure the company was happier with what we were results, they were more supportive of us when we said, we'd like to work from home too. We want more remote work. And that makes a big difference when you are a technical leader. You're able to come to terms with that and realize that to get your goals done, you need to help others reach theirs as well. And that applies to your team, your organization, and the company as a whole. So. Once you've grasped the company's goals, 
And right now, just show of hands, how many of you think you understand what the strategic goals are of the organization that you work for? <laughs> so that's your first homework assignment out of here. How many do you think your, the strategic goals of your company may be a little crazy? Yeah, okay. <laughs> They're supposed just to be audacious. Yeah. Crazy, audacious, you know. Because I've worked for those companies and went, y'all are nuts. Yeah, I mean, we do have those. Yeah. So, so our job is to figure out how to deliver on those goals in whatever space we're in, right? Yeah. So in, in this case, the technical space. So this is really balancing today and tomorrow. What needs to happen today? What needs to happen this quarter? In order to serve what needs to happen next quarter, next year, next millennia. I have a tendency to think things out. When I'm trying to come up with a solution or a goal or anything, what, how is it going to affect it five weeks, five months, five years from now? And that may seem like a lot when you're like writing out a solution for a technical problem, but it is worthwhile thinking about that. I have code still in play from 15 years ago at some places. So I'm like, yeah, I did it right. So some of the techniques that I use personally here is defining a target state. Right? That's a favorite architect term, but it's true. Defining a target state, you've got to paint a picture of where you're trying to go. Right? Many, many, many developers live in the world right in front of them. Right? Yep. And part of my job is to help them see the world a little bit beyond those walls and envision what's possible. It doesn't mean we're doing it all tomorrow, because that's the other thing. Right? Developers jump immediately to, I can't do that next week or next sprint or whatever. I'm like, dude, I'm not asking you to do that. Right? But here's where we're trying to get. We created a framework for making decisions, right? So once you've set a target state, there's a bunch of things that have to happen to get you there, right? And I want to empower the teams I work with to make those decisions, but I don't want decisions made willy-nilly, right? I don't want every scrum team or every engineer making their own decisions in a vacuum. That's how you end up with 15 different languages and 47 different frameworks, right? Not what you want. So I create a framework. We've defined the principles, right? We know the target state. We have a framework for making decisions. My company uses JIRA a lot. We're a big JIRA, big JIRA shop. So our architecture decisions are actually JIRA tickets. We file JIRA tickets. We have all the, the rationale for whatever decision we're making in JIRA. We, I publish them to the team, right? There's a log of them. And so now everyone knows. Everyone's informed. And while the decision's happening, they're all empowered to contribute, by the way, right? It's not just coming down from on high. Um, and then when, as we're building things, small or large, the design reviews ensure that whatever's being built is aligned with whatever architecture decisions have been made, right? This is like a practical way to actually be a technical leader to serve the teams that you work with, right? Because they are looking to you for that, right? Um, you demonstrate the path. So you also have to think a lot about trade-offs and short and long-term decisions and tech debt. So an example recently from my world, we just completed in June-ish a lift and shift from our own data center to a cloud, to the cloud, one big cloud. All right, now a lift and shift implies that you're basically taking what you got and hosting it in the cloud. You're not making a lot of changes except what's necessary because things work slightly differently, right? But effectively, we're running the same code there that we're running here. We know that that's not where we want to be. Right? We know that, for example, the way we've been using our MPP platform is not the way we want to use our MPP platform in the future. All right? So, but steps to get there. Right? But in the course of this lift and shift, we did have to refactor certain pipelines. So this is the analytics space, right? So we got a bazillion data pipelines running. So we, some of them needed refactoring for various reasons. So there were ways we could refactor them that served where we were headed in the future. Right? And with a little bit of thought and a little bit of conversation with the developers, we were able to make those design choices that help, that set us up for that code being ready to go when we actually get to our target state. Not that we'll never have to touch it or nothing will ever have to change, but it's probably 80% there as opposed to 0% there. So if we'd refactor it, if we built it the same way we used to build it, we'd be refactoring it again. So that's a, a practical example, and it takes a lot of thought, and you really gotta understand what's going on in, in your world in order to make those sorts of trade-offs. Um, you have to get a little closer to the details. And when things go wrong, I think it's important to decide, you know, pick your battles. Decide what is important to you, what goals are absolute must-haves, and how you work with each person. Because you're going to have those folks that completely disagree. They have a different direction. What do you decide is important versus what you say, you know what, I can let this go. Please. 
tech uh, what uh, is the, tech what debt is, tech is the question so to? technical debt is when you do something that you're going to have to pay for later so maybe you know that I'll, I'll, so I'll use the example here the specific example we do a lot of our data processing on our MPP platform my preference this the, and the trend in general would be to move that heavy data processing into Spark, not in SQL. At okay. some point, it will have to go because you know it's right. going to have problems later. Right. So if I'd, if I'd rebuilt that, that software still using SQL, when I know what we want to do is process it in Spark, that's tech debt that I would then have to un unpack and redo. Does that help? Direction and alignment. Um, I'm all about keeping on the path. Um, I have a tendency to look long term. I'm always thinking two years ahead, three years ahead, uh, and knowing what you want out of the future. It doesn't have to just be about the company, but how can you align that with what your company wants to do? Um, many people will say, you know, why? I, I, many of you probably had this discussion with your boss. Why should they send you to Summit? And you've probably heard this quote. Um, why train them if they're only going to leave? And then another manager come back and go, what if we don't and they stay? You know, it's, it's a fear. So understand that how can you sell something to your management when they say, well, I don't know if we want to pay for you to go to Summit and go, well, I'm going to learn all these skills, A, B, and C, that I can bring back here and put into place to make the company better. This is what I'm doing. I have a tendency to do that a lot. A uh, previous company that I was at, they decided they did not want my evangelism skills. They weren't going to have me present. So I collected out what it would cost for me to go to seven different events on the Oracle side at that point and threw in one Microsoft one. I was still talking them into that at that point and saying, I can go to all of these cities for this cost and do it in this timeline. And this is the revenue increase that you see from each one of these events when you do have a speaker at it. And my boss came back. If you can do that, you can put that in my budget. That's the way of aligning my goals with their goals, and it became an evangel evangelism initiative for the entire company. They ended up building a team around it. That's what you want to do. It's making it worth their time to do what you want to achieve. And I think the same is true of big strategic directions, technical directions, especially in your company, right? So the company I work for has made some declarations about what we're doing cloud-wise, right? And I still have engineers on my team that are thinking the old way. They're thinking about how we host apps in the data center, right? And, we're not, and the cloud is not a data center. Or I would, I would posit, don't treat your cloud like it's a data center, right? Because there's lots of benefits that you're missing out on. Um, so keeping um, in, in mind what the CTO has said, for example, about where she wants to go technically across the board in our company, that also helps me lead my team in terms of the technical direction we're going in. To give another example of that, um, as I was saying, I build a lot of Oracle databases out in Azure VMs. And when I started this back in January, I mean, it was really an odd situation. I recognized that many of these Oracle databases were kind of an anchor. They were holding back for, other cu for the customers to move their other databases and their other environments out to Azure. So I use that as a selling point to my boss and my boss's boss and so on and so forth of saying, this is why you should let me do this work because there wasn't any Azure consumption revenue assigned for me to move these Oracle databases. Usually they would say, uh-uh, you're not going to work on this. But because I was able to show them by lifting and shifting these Oracle databases, everything else followed. And that did have Azure consumption revenue. Everybody's like, you just go ahead and do that, Kelly. It's looking again of how you can align what you want to do and strategies that you can build into their goals that also include yours. So another thing to consider, in addition to direction and alignment, is altitude. And this one is, um, this one's a challenge. And the, the further along you go in your career and the more responsibility you have, the more you're going to have to traverse altitudes, right? So architects often get a bad rap for having their head in the clouds, right? And, and spinning up ideas that are just you know, impossible. And sometimes that's well-deserved, um, but you, sometimes you have to think constraint-free. If you start with the constraints, you will not land on the best solution. So think broader and then narrow based on whatever constraints are real, right? There might be a constraint about budget. There might be a constraint about which technologies you know, are approved by your company or, or whatever. Um, but it's always a balance, right? But at the same time, if you're too far from the details of what's happening with your scrum teams on the ground, with your teams, then you will lose credibility, right? Um, you have to 
you have to be able to deliver on whatever it is you're envisioning, right? And have data behind those things that you're coming up with, those actual ideas. And don't get too caught up in your perfect idea. Like how many of us have worked with somebody who had the perfect idea and refused to come off of it? Because there's literally absolutely no other way we could possibly do this, right? It's not true, of course, this is computers, there's always a million ways to do things, right? I was a, I guess a spectator when I was, when I first became an architect, I was a spectator with these two very senior people they spent a year, and I'm not kidding, I'm not exaggerating here, they spent a year debating which database should master a certain piece of data, right? And as a result, the project went nowhere because they couldn't agree, and neither one of them was willing to give it up. And truly, it wasn't that important. It was not a life or death, hill to die on kind of situation. But they insisted, and, they, and it churned and churned and churned because neither one of them would relent. That's not tech, that's not leadership to me. I watched that and I went, that's not leadership, right? Um, so that's one aspect of altitude and being realistic about constraints. Another example I have recently is that, okay, we have all these pipelines and we have a lot of frameworks and tools to move data around. And I had this project, it was serving data scientists, so I was trying to keep it lightweight. They needed to move from data from A to B. And we had this framework, it had been around for a while, and I thought, oh, we'll use that. So I sort of declared, we will use this. And uh, I started to write up like, what we were gonna do, and the dev manager I work with, he's like, Denise, you might wanna try that out. I was like, no, we should do it. And he's like, Denise, just try it. Well, he knew something I didn't know, which was that they'd made a bunch of changes during the cloud migration, and it didn't work as I expected. So I had written the cookbook that I was going to hand off to the data scientists, and I started walking through the cookbook, and I was very disappointed to realize that it was not going to work the way I had declared. But it was much better that I figured that out at my own desk than I had them figure it out. Because I would, first of all, they would have been really mad at me, and secondly, I would have lost all kinds of credibility, right? So. That's the altitude thing, right? I had to actually sit there and try to execute the thing that I had declared would be the, the target state for this particular project um, in order to realize that that wasn't the right direction. So we're on to the soft skills, and we all know these are extremely important. Um, when I take time to speak, because I, like I said, I'm the ADHD <laughs> spokesperson. When I go in to talk with a manager or even with team members, any of this, I'm gonna take some time to figure out what are my goals for this conversation, what is my strategy, because I could go awry for days. We don't want this. Um, what is it that other people want? I'll probably have previous conversations that kind of lead up to the main one to get uh, a feel for where is everybody sitting? What's going on? Can I incorporate their ideas into what I want to achieve as well? Can I get their buy-in beforehand so there's less debate during, during the actual conversation? That could lead it awry too. Um, I do written proposals. I love stuff in writing because I don't know how often, I don't know about the rest of you, that I go back and reread a response and I'm like, are you sure this is the same response that they sent me? I took this a complete different way. So I really like having written everything in writing and it's also helped me when I've had a manager that maybe even a coworker that wasn't as clear and may have written things that wasn't as uh, PC. Uh, then you have evidence as well when you come back and need a strategy for how to address this a little more uh, correctly. Uh, having knowledge of the subject. It also gives you research time. Always do your research. Know what you're talking about and stay on data points. Uh, so many times, how many of you have been in meetings where somebody has said to you, they, they're going off just assumptions. It's his code. It's her application. They got no data behind this but they're sure of it. This happens to you like hourly, I have a feeling. You do it. Okay. <laughs> He's like over here going, yes, yes, yes. Um, that frustrates me um, more than anything. I will be very quick when someone says, well, can't you just, I, I mean, just guess, give us an assumption. What do you think is going on? And I'm very good about just saying, you know what? I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't go back to my desk and do some research on this. I've got to give you the right answer. If I give you assumptions, it's just going to keep going on and on and people will repeat it and it does no one any good. And people be mad at me at the moment, but it has kept my credibility. It has made it so people will always come back to me over and over and over again because they know I'm gonna do the research and get them the right answer. I may not get them the quick answer, but they know they're gonna get the correct information from me, and I think that's essential as you're starting with these communication skills. I also have a tendency to try to say things the way that people wanna hear them. How do I wanna hear them? That's how, when I say something, I'm like, if it was me on the receiving end, how would I want somebody to say this to me? Which really helps. 
Um, that means that you've got that empathy, you have that connection with somebody and you're treating them as a person with respect, even if they might not be treating me with respect at that moment. And the mechanics of how we do this, I'm sorry, I swapped, slide, swift, swapped slides on you, Kellen, that was my bad. Yeah, um, keeps me on my toes. That's right. See, she just rolled with you guys, you didn't even notice, did you? So, some of the mechanics of how you do this and how to think about it. Verbal skills, obviously, Kellen's just spoken about that, very important. Be concise. Don't try to bowl people over with the wall of words. They just, their eyes close over, they get lost, right? It's not helping anybody. Um, but verbal's not enough. You need other kinds of artifacts. And I would submit that written prose is a very effective tool. If you're going to bother to write something, especially when you're trying to develop some technical ideas, don't do it in PowerPoint, right? Because PowerPoint still needs a ton of voiceover, right? And so you're, you need to write paragraphs. Sometimes you need to write white papers or two pagers or six pagers or whatever is appropriate. And that's really an effective way to scale out the communication of your ideas, right? Otherwise, you find yourself repeating the stories over and over again. People are half listening. They're multitasking. They're hearing different things. The written word is really powerful, right? So you need both verbal and written. You also need pictures, right? How many of you have been in rooms, in meetings, where people start drawing with their hands, right? Start drawing on the whiteboard with their hands, or maybe they start whiteboarding. It's worth spending some time to do a straw person diagram before you walk in that room. She who draws the diagram drives the conversation. So when I walk in with a picture, that gives people something to react to. It gives them something to hang their thoughts on. It'll change, it'll iterate, and it should, but it's a really valuable starting point as opposed to the air drawings, which nobody captures, and then you repeat yourself in the next meeting. So draw That's the pictures. That's what I use PowerPoint for. I build out diagrams and I bring them clear, quickly and she's right. I own the conversation because I already have pictures of everything that we're going and what I'm seeing. I want to make sure that the technical and the non-technical people that are in that room know what's going on. I want my artifacts to stand on their own. Eventually I shouldn't have to be in the room for people to get the notions that I'm trying to communicate, right? They should be able to look at the pictures and read the, the prose and understand what I'm saying. And finally, as Kellen mentioned a minute ago, Code or pseudocode, right? I guarantee you, when you're pitching ideas, your engineers are already coding in their heads, right? They've, they've stopped listening to half of what you're saying, and they're already trying to figure out, oh, okay, what function, whatever it is, right? Offer them some pseudocode to, to help them think in their language, right? You're, you're trying to bridge a gap between a couple different ways of communicating technically. Um, so all of these things need to be in your toolkit, I would say, to be an effective technical leader and communicate your, your ideas and your thoughts. So influencers communicate often. Um, I'm always talking. I'm always communicating. Not that you can tell right now. Um, I, I like to talk to people. And like I said, I bridge out early on as I'm headed towards a goal of figuring out who's going to be involved in this conversation, who should I talk to. And I start having those conversations early in written, in verbal form, you know, in person, WebEx. I want to know what's going on in the feel of the room and start to connect. Um, I am known for tweeting things. Everybody knew this week that they needed to stop clicking on reply all for a welcome email because I had put on Twitter, there is a special place in hell for these people. They knew very quickly they needed to stop. I mean, I, I don't fool around. I want to connect with people and I'm quite blunt about that. But um, having those communications and being clear about your word, I influence. I am known for that. But even having these conversations with customers, like I said, a lot of times I'm brought in on Oracle situations. And the conversation that I had this last week where they brought me in with Oracle support was supposed to be in the call too, as an example. And the gentleman had been, he was the Oracle DBA, had been a roadblock for four months. And at the end of the call, he says, I sent you the email, but it bounced back. And I started talking to him, and you know, I said, you used KE Gorman? He says, yeah. And I said, at Microsoft? Oh, no, I sent it at oracle.com. <laughs> he assumed I worked for Oracle. He's like, you sound just like an Oracle DBA. And I said, well, I am an Oracle DBA. I just happened to work for Microsoft. Um, I had won him over. 
That was important, of understanding where he was coming from, to talk his language, and then to bridge it with the Microsoft people of understanding what was going on and to build these solutions. I have a tendency to do that. I'm doing a lot of translating, but I was talking with him very early on as soon as I found out what problems they were going through and starting to build a rapport with him so I could get him on my side and build him towards that solution instead of being a roadblock. And I think that's important when you're influencing people is that you're influencing them for the right reasons. Because you will have people on the sidelines going, fight, fight, fight. And you're like, mm, you're not helping. Do you know these folks? Does this sound familiar? Yeah. Getting those disengaged to get them to disarm and to be part of that solution is really a difficult skill to master. But it's part of being a leader is getting everybody on the same page, helping them buy into the solution. And you do that by finding out, again, what their goals are and can you incorporate them as part of it. So now we're talking about motivation. I'm not authentic at all. Not <laughs> <laughs> we'll just start right there. Um, you, I don't know if you can see the boots. Yeah. Yeah. I. I do strongly believe in authenticity. I was one of those that uh, I was kind of being geared towards more management, uh, getting a lot of administration tasks. My other DBAs were getting the technical tasks. And I'm an ADHD kid. I was getting bored. So I went to my boss back in 2005, and I said, I'm the lead DBA. I want the technical challenges, too. And they're going to my DBAs instead. And they're saying, Kellen, here's this administration test. And I was frustrated. And he kind of looked up at me real quick. And he says, stop dressing like a, a, you know, an ad admin then. And I kind of looked down. And I was in a pencil skirt and pumps. And I was dressed in just standard wear. And I hadn't really thought about it. I milled it around and said, you know, I could just dress like me. So I showed up the next day for a meeting with black fingernails. And I thought this was just kind of a stupid thing, but I just wanted to test it out. And people started asking me, you know, like, Kellen, what made you just black fingernails? Kellen, nice manicure, stuff like that. But they were so curious about what was going on with me, they started asking me technical questions too during the meeting. And I'm like, really? This is all it took? Really? <laughs> yeah. So by the end of the week, I was in combat boots and just let my goth self kind of come out. And I am kind of goth light in my old age. But at this point, I was pretty, I mean, black lipstick, the whole thing. And nobody mistaken me for anything other than technical from that point on. And it was really bizarre how I was able to be authentically myself and make it very clear to them, I know it's expected maybe the dress code. And I even felt that when I went to Microsoft, I'm going to be meeting with customers. I probably should dress a little more professional. Well, I went and sold to, you know, I had to architect out the entire city of New York a couple weeks ago. And all I heard was, awesome, Doc Martens. <laughs> so you find out that authenticity is something people want to hear. They want somebody they feel is real. They want somebody who they feel will accept them more. And that is incredibly important. That you reach out, that you talk to people, you just connect with them is really essential. It's an essential skill, especially in IT, because we may be more socially awkward. I'm very much an introvert. I know you people aren't seeing that, but I am. I really am. And that we may not feel like reaching out, but that connecting with folks is one of the best ways to get them on your side. And again, bring them towards that leadership piece. That I reach out to a lot of people and say, I see you may be having a challenge here. How can I help you achieve what you want? That I am my true self and that I go out online all the time and go, I'm just a dork today. This is what I did. I screwed up. People were surprised. I would talk about my challenges as being a woman in tech. And other women would start emailing me, I mean, by the hundreds, saying, I went through this too. I thought it was just me. Being that authentic person and being honest about what you may not be as strong in and like, in, like really absorbing and embracing your weaknesses helps you kind of overcome them. So I strongly believe in that as well. And that's part of that next slide, I think. And um, we talk about what this means, because authentic is one of those things that I think is kind of abused out on social media. People say, I'm so authentic, and they're really just copying the other girl's Instagram or the other guy's Twitter handle. That's not it. It's really being you. It's being who you are from, I mean, from your soul. And um, you've got to be you know, comfortable with that. 
It is based off of the person that you are inside that you are able to be comfortable with that person and talk to those people. And that's when we get into just your leadership and your company and who you work for. Um, being true to your own personality, that this is who I am and I have a lot of value as this person in providing these, you know, these skill set, this uh, leadership, this position, and how I can help the company be more. This is another one. Um, what is authenticity? And uh, one of the things that people always told me is that I keep my promises. Even though I may not be able to do all the things that people come to me, uh, I was the, kind of the it girl for a while on the Oracle side, I would find others who could. So they'd still connect with me and network with me because they knew even if I couldn't do it, I knew someone who could. You know, I, I kept that promise uh, that I'd meet deadlines, that um, I was willing to try to go out of my way even when I was tired. If I said I was going to do something, I'm going to come through and I was going to do it. I was extremely dependable. I served on boards. I was one that um, people would say, hey, could you write an article for me or could you, you know, pen a recommendation or a reference? Because somebody I believed in always, always did those things. Um, I took a uh, re recommendation for my boss from 2005 yesterday while I was sitting in the conference. You know, those are the kind of things that you're saying, I am here for you, I stand up for what I believe in. Um, we're just very true to ourselves. There have been many times where I have voiced concerns knowing that it would have been easier to just be a yes man, just, you know, to kind of say, oh, everything's all right, and we won't say our complaints or that this was an uncomfortable situation. I would step up and voice that problem and say, even though this may be something that temporarily looks like it might set back my career, in the end, I would own it, and it became a strength. On the uh, Oracle side, there was a lot of discomfort with women in technology conversations that I had. It has now become quite a movement. We were able to increase the uh, women in tech at even my own regional conference from 7% up to 22% by having the real conversations and here are real small solutions and changes that we can make to fix this. Um, that was really difficult. And I was told, Kellen, you will never get your ACE director back, which is MVP for those of you on this Microsoft side. You'll never get it back. And I said, it's worth it. I would rather see more women involved in tech. I think that with the amount of jobs that we're going to have in another, you know, even two years, we kind of need them. It's all right. This is worth it in the long run. Thank you. Wow. You people are so sweet. Yes, true. <laughs> so we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're talking about motivation and motivating, and Kellen's just, I think, motivated all of us, which is touch the room. Um, we also want to talk about how we motivate our teams and how we support our teams. Um, Kellen mentioned this earlier, right? Some, some leaders, lead, and I actually I'll call them managers, not leaders, right? Some managers are afraid of having their people learn stuff because they're afraid they're going to leave. Those are, the, those are the managers who you don't want to work for, right? We should all be seeking to advance our own careers and helping the people around us. And technology moves fast, right? We all know that. Every, you know, announcements, um, think about how much has changed in your career, how much has changed in the last five years, right? So not only do we need to keep up, but we need to encourage our teams to keep up, and we need to help them with that, right? So it can be quite overwhelming when you look out all the sessions you could go to, like here, right? Or all the webinars you could attend or whatever. So how do you help your folks sort of make, learn about things that will both motivate them but help them in their careers, right? So again, I've got a vision for where we're headed, right, with my team. Um, I work with a dev manager who part of his job is helping his folks develop. And so we work together to combine the technologies that I know we're, or I think we're going to need with what interests the people on the team, right, so that they have an opportunity. Um, recent example, I've talked about this lift and shift. So we're in the cloud now. There's a whole bunch of new services we could potentially take advantage of. I made a list of, I forget how many, that I wanted to at least explore so we could decide how we wanted to use them if we were going to use them. I created Jira epics for each one, and I offered the team to pick the one they wanted to explore. So they, it was in the direction we need to go, right, becoming more proficient in these various cloud services. But they got to have a little say in which way they, the, the thing they were interested in, right? And so I created an opportunity for them to become our local expert in a given service, right? And so it helps their own professional development. They're now known as an expert in XYZ service. Um, they had some freedom um, to catch, to figure out how to learn this stuff. Um, so all of that helps them. 
Now, I also do other things, like I look for opportunities. I, you know, you get on a million mailing lists, if I see a webinar come through that I think the team might benefit from, I'll make sure I push that out in case they're not on the mailing list. Small things like that um, help create opportunities for folks and let them know that you are interested in and supportive of their development, which is part of my job as being a technical leader. But there's also keeping our own skills sharp, right? And, and Kel and I were talking about this. This can often be the hardest thing to do, right? Because we have all these responsibilities and all these various uh, things we have to do every day. So the number one thing you got to do as a technical leader in terms of keeping your own skills sharp is keep up on the trends. Don't get myopic about what your company is doing. Come here. You guys are all here, right? So that's great. Um, don't skip the keynotes. Right? Understanding where your vendor is going right, is very important. Of the things you heard about today, hopefully the wheel, in the keynote I mean, the wheels are turning about how you might be able to take advantage of that in your world. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next quarter, but you can plan for that. So you, you want to keep on top of those trends both with your vendor and in how other companies are doing things. Again, conferences are fantastic for that, right? Because you get to meet lots of other people facing similar problems. But you also have to keep your tech skills sharp a little closer to the weeds, right? You have to, and this is the hard thing, I think. I have a very hard time finding time to do hands-on stuff. And I have to be very specific about what I'm going to do. If I just say, oh, I need to learn something new, it, never, it doesn't happen like that. So what I try to do is, one, have a goal, and have a goal that's reachable, right? It may not be a 30-hour online course that I can finish, but maybe I can finish two modules of it, or whatever it is, right? And I try to hold myself accountable by putting that in my own goals, my own professional development goals that I discussed with my manager, um, and, and carving out the time, carving out the time to do that. Um, I want to add on that one. Uh, one of the things that I do, I lived in Denver before I moved into the RV, and Turing School with Girls Develop It, we had, I don't know, how many of you have meetup.com accounts? Which is awesome, thank you. Um, I ran Girl Geek Dinners and Girls Develop It and the Women of Code. We all were partnered with the schools like Turing School and Galvanize. And they would have Saturday classes. And it was just a Saturday, really cheap, $20 to $80. You could learn JavaScript one day, learn HTML, learn CSS. And they were great classes. They were often taught by the same teachers that were teaching in those boot camps. And you could learn a lot in just one day. And those were things that I would do for myself. It was a learning day for me. And it never impacted you know, my work day or anything else. But it was kind of fun to do. And you got to network with more people, new people that were outside your, maybe your little realm of ex experience that you're, your influence that you were dealing with. And the last method we want to mention is learning to teach others. Right? So nothing <laughs> makes you better at a technology than having to stand up in a room like this and explain it. Right? And that is really how people learn, by blogging about things, by presenting on things. And again, it does, you don't have to be an expert in the whole stack. You could be an expert in one piece of it, right? or develop your expertise. And it's OK not to know all the answers. Humility is an important part of being a technical leader, too. So pay attention to this. right? You, if you want to be viewed as somebody who is a technical leader in your organization, you, got, you need to know what's happening out there. And you need to be able to speak on it with intelligence. My blog I do on things that I need to remember. I don't know how often I've been out there searching on Google. And I'm like, boy, this article that I'm reading sounds really familiar. <laughs> and I've written it, yeah. It was like years ago. And my most popular blogs, I would have never thought were popular. They're like enterprise manager for Oracle, agent on HPUX to Windows 95 or something. It was like bizarre things. And I documented it so I could go back and I knew how to do it. But other people needed that information, too. So you blog about anything, anything that you think you need to know, you'll find out other people need to know, know too. So now we want to transition to talk about mentorship and sponsorship. How many people know the difference between a mentor and a sponsor? Here's a quick way to remember. Mentors talk to you. Sponsors talk about you. So if I put myself in the role of being a mentor or a sponsor, I'm talking to someone or I'm talking to someone else about them. Um, I do this a lot. I didn't realize it when I started out. Um, mentoring seemed very important to me because I had had some fantastic mentors when I started. My husband was actually my first mentor. That's not how he got a wife out of it, I swear to God. Um, it was eight years before we ever dated. Okay, just get that straight, people. Um, yeah. But, uh, I mean, he was wonderful to me. Alex Gorbachev from Pythian. I mean, these were wonderful, wonderful people within the Oracle community who sponsored me, came to me and said, come work for me. 
you should present at our mug. You should be on the board of directors for this user group. Things like that, that I would have never considered on my own. That Jonathan Geddick, who's out at the A-Press booth, came to me and said, you should write a book for us. Uh, Oracle Nerd said, you should be blogging. You, you don't have a blog? Come blog on Oracle Nerd. Things like that were extremely important to why I stayed in tech while many of the other women in tech around me were disappearing. I understood that difference pretty early on. So as I was mentoring, it just seemed natural to me. At that time, like I said, I was kind of an it girl at Oracle. People were all coming to me with these opportunities and I couldn't take them all on, so I found other people who do it. And I'm doing that now with the Microsoft side where there have been a number of women that are, and, and men that have written books this year that I brought to Jonathan and said, this is the person you want to author that book. They understand this technology the best. I'm not the right person. You know, having that is part of sponsorship. To say, oh, you're looking for so-and-so for this kind of role, let me introduce you to somebody. My husband starts at Microsoft in three weeks to take the role I didn't take <laughs> because I like my team. I'm really happy at my team. And I was like, I know somebody who does what I do. And that's, I'm, I'm sponsored him. I think that's extremely crucial when you're able to do that. It will pay back and pay forward so many times over. And it really is part of the gig, right? I had a, a, someone who was a VP, an engineering VP fellow, actually, at my company. I put him with a young engineer. I said, hey, would you mind having coffee with this guy? Just, and afterward, I thanked him. I said, hey, Joe, I appreciate you doing that. He goes, Denise, it's part of the gig. And this was years ago. And I always remember that. And whenever I see somebody, someone reaches out to me, needs a help, needs a question answered, yeah. a connection. Try to remember, it is part of the gig, right? It is a big part of the gig. Um, Nora Denzel was a, a executive coach. She was a VP at Intuit at one point, and she's spoken here, actually, a few years ago. And she has this quote, it's not who you know, it's not what you know, it's who knows what you know. And that is a sponsor, right? Someone who will talk about your work and what you do. Um, I had an opportunity. This is, this is a great example of the whole networking thing working. Front-end engineer, I never met her. She was in another part of our company. She was really interested in data. She was hearing about data. She was trying to figure out, how do I get into data? And she would talk to someone who talked to someone who put her in touch with me. So we started having one-on-ones. I gave her some suggestions about what to study, and she would tell me what she was doing. And we talked about different roles in data and where she could go. About six months later, this opportunity showed up on my team, like a perfect opportunity for someone to transition from another engineering discipline into data. And she was top of mind for me. Right, of course. I was able to recommend her for the job. She got the role. Win, win, win. Right? She's super motivated. Right? She was always motivated. She reached out looking for the knowledge. And now she's become a data engineer. Side benefit, we now have someone with some front end skills. Because I don't know about the rest of you all in the back end, but what do the UIs for your tools look like? <laughs> so we're definitely benefiting from that um, as well. Calm and chaos. Um, part of being a leader has a lot to do with the morale and being calm when things go wrong. Uh, I worked for a company that, as I was leaving, we knew that two DBAs needed to come in as I was leaving because there should have been two DBAs all along. I was fulfilling that role. And I knew both the DBAs that I recommended. One, I expected her to take over my leadership skills, and the other DBA would take over my, my workhorse stuff. He, he, would, he was a really fantastic DBA. And I came back a year later when my favorite DBA, Terry, was leaving. I took over his role. I came back after doing some contract stuff. And uh, they had made the workhorse guy the lead. And I was like, what? what? What happened here? And it was a natural bias thing. They just they thought of the guy's name instead of her, even though I'd made this recommendation. And the thing that came about very quickly, I had been there only about two weeks, you saw the problem, is that when things went wrong, this person just got frazzled, freaked out, became snippy, yelling at people, became very concerned, could not work through things. He wanted to fix it himself because he's the workhorse. You know, that was the role he should have been in and instead he should have been, he's supposed to be the leader and he can't delegate, he can't work through this problem and he's yelling at everybody and morale is being hit and of course people start leaving, you got turnover. This is really important as you are going into leadership even in a non management role. If you want people to follow you, you need to be calm in chaos. Uh, my husband will always talk about a DBA, a lead DBA that he worked with at a big company because he, his dumb DBA trick as he likes to call it, he dropped a 95 terabyte index on an Oracle database. Yeah, 
he freaked out, but he went to Abdul and he says, this is what happened, you know? And Abdul just looked and he says, guess we should start getting on recreating that. And that was it, you know? And they started working through it and he always appreciated that, that this individual understood, you are a professional. If this happened, it happened, let's get it fixed. And I think that's extremely crucial, that you can stay calm, figure out a problem, prioritize the fix, and work through it and treat the people around you with respect when those kind of chaotic situations happen. Filter out those, or filter out what chaos could be brought to your team because you may have other people in other groups that are causing chaos going, you know what? We're working on a really high, you know, high priority situation here. Gotta get this back up and running. I need you to leave the rest of these people alone so they can get their job done. And do it in a respectful way, but very firm. That kind of leadership skill is paramount. It makes a huge difference that you can do that. Oh, I think we already went through this, okay. though. Yeah. Okay. Or we're I good. I my transition. No, we're good. Yeah, I just keep adding things on slides on her. I don't tell her. <laughs> and then working. confidence. Um, yeah, I'm pretty confident. No question about that. I, I never thought of it as confidence. I always thought it, that I was just comfortable with being a dork. Um, that, that's just me. I, you know, when things would go wrong, I'd watch people who may be more insecure, like spinning out of control. I had one boss who just said, if you have a, a workplace bully, put Kellen with him, and they will start to freak out like there's no business. They'll be gone so quick, not even funny, because they'd start poking at me, and you know, I like this. And all of a sudden, I'd be like, wham! They, they were gone. I mean, I would just spin them up to the point that they would end up leaving. Um, but it had a lot to do with confidence that I was comfortable with who I was. If I made a mistake, I owned up to it really quick and just said, I just screwed up. I just did this, you know. And I was comfortable with myself. And that's one of the things to understand the difference between, I think, arrogance and, um, you know, when somebody goes into even narcissism, is that confidence is, is that you are confident with who you are even when you are being an idiot. That you're like, I just screwed up. I did something stupid. I'm taking responsibility for this. And you move forward. You don't just sit there and dwell on it forever. You look at it, you say, this is what happened. I need to fix it and I need to move forward. So if you're trying to figure out how to deal with confidence and how to become more confident, that is some of the biggest um, recommendations I can make to you is really embracing the weaknesses you have. How can I get better? How can I move past this and move forward and not let those, those crazy people get to you either? Don't be like me. Don't wind them up because it does cause a lot of stress to your boss too. You have a question, please. So the question is, what if your boss won't let you but own you it? I have a question back for you. Do you feel that he is micromanaging you about that and he continues? He doesn't want to fix it, but he also wants to kind of focus on it, hyper-focus on it. No. 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 He was a weird boss. There's a lot of those out there. There really are. We're going to have a whole section on your boss. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to get into good bosses. I believe your job is only as good as your boss. So I, I really do. Um, that role that my husband took, great team they're building, great people. I was just so happy where I was working. I have a great team. Does anybody know Hope Foley here? I've heard the name. Yeah, Hope's on my team. And I've got another gentleman, Dustin Ryan. There's only three of us that cover the US. Uh, we work for a gentleman by the name of Denny Ramsey. And Denny is awesome. He just lets me run amok. It is awesome. No. He's, he's great, though. He really is great. He manages me the way I need to be managed. What do you need? Can I help? Um, are there any issues right now? I see you're doing this. This is good. I see you doing that. Eh, not so crazy about it. Stop it. You know, I appreciate that just clear, concise to the fact. Um, and I will take that over anything else in my world. So I think that's important. But I have worked for bad bosses. I will also tell you I have fired my own boss twice. <laughs> um, my very first lead DBA I worked for, um, I was a junior DBA in the situation, first DBA job I ever worked with. It's where I met my husband, too. And he had walked in. I was about to leave technology. I was about to leave as, the lead, as a DBA. The other junior DBA I started with had already gone over the project management group. They had great 
technical leads over there. I mean, these women just had it going on. They were awesome. And I was almost leaving there. I'd already managed the disaster recovery project. I was on the SOX project. And we did what was called a recovery manager class with my the man who's now my husband. Do you guys know what our man is for Oracle? DBAs, I know Oracle mm -hmm. DBAs are like, our man. Yeah, <laughs> we live by it. But it was my first class. And after I got done with the class with the other DBAs, my husband, this is how he sponsored me. He went to the boss and he said, is Kellen leaving the DBA team? And he says, yeah, she's gonna go over the project management team. He says, don't let her go. This girl gets tech like this. She is on it. Do not lose her as a DBA. He sponsored me at that moment and kept me. And this manager was very good. He was only there for six months. But he came back to me and he says, how do you wanna come back to the team? Hmm. And I said, I'm not coming back the way I left. No, no, no. I said, you have this lead, DBA, that 50% of the time she's right, 50% of the time she is dead wrong. And we have database systems going down in production. And then she disappears for three days. And I said, this has to stop. It costs the company money, it costs us time, it costs us chaos. I mean, it, this is not good for anyone. And nobody's addressing it. I said, so I would like to come back as the DBA coordinator. These are all senior DBAs I'm working with. I'm a junior but I do have the project management skills. So I came back as a coordinator, put a process in place that tracked everything that was assigned out to everyone. And a month later, this good manager left, somebody else came in who wasn't, you know, back into the old yes man situation. And I came after him in a month and I like came up and went, boom, <laughs> this paperwork and said, okay, this is what's going on. She's doing it again. She's blamed it on Kathy. This isn't what happened. She brought the system down. You can see it in the system. I want this addressed. He says, I can't do it, Kellen. Does she have a picture of the CEO with a chicken? What is it? You know? And he's like, no, I can't do it. I said, I'm going to HR. And Kathy and Susan are and Charlie are all behind her. She's gonna go to HR. And I'm like, yes, I know I'm the voice of the team, yeah. You know, and they said, go, please. And I went to HR and that was a Thursday night and they walked her out the Monday morning. I fired my own boss. I had the paperwork, I had everything together. Um, but I went to HR with that same thing. This is expensive to the company, it costs all the users time, it costs us time, it costs us money. I want this address, it's not fair to this lead to tell her this is okay. You're bringing down the systems, there's no learning future for this. Um, I have done this twice though. I also took my team and went to HR and said it was a conflict of interest for the DBA team to report to the development manager and moved us over to operations. And they're still no, reported up, I'm don't sorry. Don't mess with her. Oh, God. <laughs> don't, don't mess with her. Yeah, everybody was terrified for me for yeah, years, too. Hey, hey, hey Kellen. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Kellen's management training school, school will be uh, opening soon, right? <laughs> Question. Um, she question, had already, question. yeah, the question was, was it hard for me to know that I was going to fire a woman back then? Um, at that point, she had already cost the junior um, DBA. This story goes back to my women in tech story. This junior DBA and I started out together. We were both hired together. We had never worked in databases. This woman had a CS degree. She was coming in to work on Oracle databases. She was a woman of color. This girl could take on the world. Oh my God, she was so powerful. And nine months in, she says, Kellen, I'm not gonna make it. She left. And I kept looking at her going, you got a CS degree, you have no children. I got a brand new baby and three kids and no degree. If you can't make it, how am I going to? It really impacted me that she left. So the thought that there was other people, because I knew Kathy was about to leave too. This was a Sybase DBA. We were turning into an Oracle DBA that we needed. This is the person that taught me corn shell. If you come to my other session, I'm teaching you people bash scripting. I couldn't have done that without that other DBA that she blamed for the outage. These, this is how important those people were to me. No, when I look at the greater good, when I look at strategy, no, it doesn't matter if it's male or female, it talks about the greater good overall. So. Oh, she's telling me to get I just going. Want, I just want to make sure we, we have a few more topics. I just want to make sure we touch on. Yes. These are great stories, though. Kellen's fun, and it's only Wednesday, so I encourage you to hang out with her. Um, I want to say one more thing about confidence, just to come yeah. back to that. So there is nothing more powerful than making yourself vulnerable to your team, 
right? You will gain more respect from your team by admitting what you did wrong. That's a leader. That's leadership, and especially with technology. I think another important aspect of a technical leader is some, and this is any leader truly, who somebody who tries to balance the team strengths and weaknesses, right? The biggest mistake you can make is hire people who are just like you in any dimension, right? Yep. That's not a strong team. A strong team has an array of people who have different kinds of strengths and weaknesses that they bring to the table, and the whole of the team is what delivers. I have the good fortune right now to work for a manager who gets this, who's very thoughtful about the team he's assembled, very conscious about the choices he makes. Um, and I know that I'm really strong in one thing. My partner, Ravi, over here is really strong in something else, and we have each other's backs, right? So not being afraid of what you don't know or what you're not good at um, is an incredibly powerful message to send your team and will, will engender respect from the people that, who work with you. Now we're, now we're here to the manager stuff. I don't know how much you um, I really do believe in this. Um, I interview my potential manager probably more than they do, um, my last number of jobs. I have, you can't guarantee you're going to work for that boss forever but it makes a huge difference. Every job that I've left it, I've heard this, uh, that uh, people leave because of bad bosses, not because of bad companies. And that has been my life. Um, my bosses that, you know, I'll go to dinner with them beforehand. I will talk to them for hours. I want to know how they manage. Because I know if somebody tries to micromanage me, oh my God. And it, or if I'm bored, I'll just get into trouble. They don't want that. No, 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 no. <laughs> Um, th there's a white paper called The Care and Feeding of Your Hacker. Has anybody ever seen this? This is me. Yeah, you don't want me in your system if I'm just going to be sitting there spinning, you know, with a spinner. Yeah, not you need <laughs> to keep me very, 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 very busy. Um, so I would find out what's the workload like? How much time do you spend? And I talk to other people too. Last number of jobs that I went to, I asked the people or asked the people I was going to work with and work for, are you all right that I go to my future coworkers and talk to them about what this role is really like? I am not scared to ask questions. Um, before I accept offers, I already have a networked connection inside that company to review my offers. Before I came to Microsoft, Bruno Borges, yep, went through my offers. Before I went to Oracle, it was Mary Melgard. Because I know if I want to network and I want to make sure that I've got a good negotiation, I know I need somebody on the inside they know all the tips and tricks. So that is important to me. It's not just my bosses. I have my sponsors, my mentors inside any company before I go to it. Um, my company with, with Delphix, it was Kyle Haley. Always have those. But also knowing from them what I need to know, they investigate the teams that I'm looking at that I'm interested in working for. And for like even Oracle, Mary Melgard said, I talked to some folks. You don't want to go to this team. I know you've got an offer with them. Not a healthy team. And she was right. And three months, they had dissolved that team. My team was stayed together, the one I went to. She was able to find out that information. Always good to do. Um, I asked them these questions. Um, what can they do to help me grow and, and move? If you get that question, and I think it's something they're just told to ask, where do you want to be in five years in this company? That is the most stupid question I've ever heard in my life. Because if you look at my resume, you should start getting real nervous about two years. Yeah. I disappear every two years. You know, this is how I've been able to increase my salary and get above all the guys that I work with. Um, you know, there's there's method to all my madness. <laughs> so, you know, they shouldn't be asking me, what am I going to do in five years? And I'm like, it's not I'm going to tell you I'm going to be your boss. I'm probably going to work for another company for twice what you're paying me now. That's, that's the truth of it. So nobody wants to hear that. Um, so always have those honest talks with them, find out what they think. Um, and the other thing is because I was going up, constantly going up, I would have to have these talks with bosses where they were like, but I thought you would en really enjoy rearranging the, sh the SharePoint online environment. And I'm like, would Adam enjoy doing this? Well, no. Adam and I have the same role. Why do you think I do? And so this is mostly for the women in the room. Do you feel this pressure of somebody saying, here's an administrative task and they think that you will do it over your male peers? Yeah, I don't, she's like, absolutely. <laughs> um, I always had this. Uh, and I would be like, nope, nope. If Adam won't enjoy doing it, I, I lucked out my last job. We had the same, the same role. We were both DevOps engineers, and I could do that. I would say, would Adam enjoy that? Oh, no. Why are you giving it to me? 
you know. And there's always going to be things that you have to do that you don't enjoy. But it's like, no, can we share those tasks? Yeah. So, you know, make sure they understand just because you're going up the technical ladder doesn't mean you have to give up what you love. All right. The last dimension of this we want to talk about is the next level. So we've talked a lot about the teams that we work with, right, where we might be the tech lead and we've got folks that we're, we're um, influencing and guiding in that direction. But there's another important part of being seen as a technical leader in your organization, and that is being seen by the folks above you on the food chain, right? Being recognized as someone who has a point of view, who has a well-thought-out, cogent argument for why we should or should not do something, and is not afraid to share that with people who maybe are not on your immediate team. So the key here is, we've talked about understanding the goals, right? You don't want to come out of left field and say we should be doing this when it's completely divorced from the company's, company's goals. Is realistic about the technical direction. If your company has just adopted vendor A, don't immediately argue that we should be migrating to vendor B. Instead, figure out how to use vendor A effectively. Um, be grounded in reality, but also have a vision and being able to communicate that in all the ways that we've described today. Having a point of view is very powerful. How many times have you sat in a room and people are like, don't have an opinion or seem to not have an opinion, right? Having a point of view helps drive the conversation, right? So by becoming known as someone who can articulate that point of view and is not afraid to do so, eventually you get the opportunities to influence other people. So this whole migration to the cloud has been a big part of my life for the last however many years now. Um, and through going through a bunch of missteps, I have a very strong point of view on what we should be doing. And I am now getting, have created an opportunity, slash am getting the opportunity, to have these conversations with the chief architect of the company about where I think we should go. And that's because I haven't been afraid to have a point of view, right, and, and to speak it. Now, I also need to listen to his perspective on things. Everything I think we should do is not necessarily going to happen, but I'm in the room. I'm at the table, right? And that is an affirmation that I am viewed as a technical leader within my organization. I feel that same way. Um, networking, being connected to the company. I have only been at Microsoft for a year and four months now. And our SQL Server 2019 book is going to come out here in another four weeks with Buck Woody. Um, I'm writing a series of blogs for both Redgate and Microsoft. They have reached out. They've embraced me because I did have that opinion. I was willing to have those communication. I was willing to put my foot down and say, I want to talk about this, have really, you know, an honest talk about what's really good about this and where we can improve. But I gave them options. I didn't just complain about things. And I think that's important. When you give people options, they're much more willing to listen to you. And that makes you an influencer. That means that you're saying, I see that there's a problem here, but we can do better and we can work together to get there. And how about that? We have a few minutes for questions. I want to thank don't, you all for your attention. Yes, sir, in the front row. So you talked uh, a little bit about authenticity and being true to yourself. Um, my question, my challenge in being a leader in my organization is that my authentic self has been a mask. <laughs> <laughs> How do I balance that out with, with trying to be more empathetic when I really am not? Do you want me to answer that one? Please. <laughs> Think, do we ever, so for the, I'll clean it up for the recording. Yeah. Uh, his authentic self is not a very empathetic person. How can he balance some of his natural tendencies to become a more empathetic leader? Um, I'm extremely blunt. And one of the things that we found out is some of, especially on the Oracle side, not the Microsoft side, that uh, some of the, the older dudes in the room wasn't too thrilled with me having such a strong opinion and being very strong technically. And I had to learn how to say things very clearly when they were incorrect. Uh, as we talked about, I was working with this Oracle DBA that he had 30 years of experience. He knew exactly what he was talking about, and he didn't need to talk to somebody from Microsoft. And for me to come back to him and, one, base on data, two, be online with what their goals are. I can be blunt and say, I know that you were willing to send me these reports, these performance reports. That's really, you know, I appreciate that. But you were locked in on what older technology was utilized to build that report, not on how it works now. And if you make this change, it's going to work better for you. And you can get all that data and see what's really going on under the covers. And all of a sudden, you went, oh, I did not realize that. But I had to focus my blunt response of you are wrong and realize, I don't want to tell you your baby's ugly, but... <coughs> You know, and try to gear it up there. 
you can still be pretty blunt, but also think about before you talk, how does that other person maybe want to hear this? If it was me, how would I want to hear this? Think about it in the kindest possible way, but always be honest. I am. I, you know, I'll be like, I don't want to lie to you. I'm going to tell you what I need to tell you, but it's important to me that you're hearing it too. If you are shutting down, then I'm not getting anywhere. Have the goal of getting to your goal. So that is the a suggestion very good, is that you can yeah. tell them that you'll get back to them and put it in writing. Uh, we'll have time for one more question, and then we, we will hang around. Cal Callan, we have a few minutes to hang around afterwards. I right? don't. I will. Um, I'll hang around. Yeah. One more question. I'm, I'm being text going, okay. we're in this other room. Where are you? Going back to data versus assumptions, hypothetical, what if you have a situation where you have to make a decision and all you have are assumptions? I don't believe in it. I would question. say, you know what, yeah, what do you do when there are only assumptions that you can base your decision off of? I, I honestly will say that's all I have, so I'm going to go back and do some research because right now we do not have the information we need to come up with a decision. I'm dealing with that right now with this customer. This customer has brought their windows down in their, their Oracle reports so that it's not even capturing anything so that it can build a report. And I had to come back and say that. You don't have the complete picture here, so we're not going to assume that the database isn't guilty. I can't do that. You haven't given me that data. As everyone's leaving, we want to thank you all for your attention. We thank appreciate you. you being here. Please fill out your session evaluations. Yes. We hear that all week, but we really, really need them. And I have Halloween candy for anyone who wants one. Because otherwise, she has to eat it. Or I have to take it home. Are they left over?